Thank you for that kind introduction, Dr. Kissel. <laughs> so today I'll be talking to you a little bit about the research that's done in my lab. And at Benedictine, um, we have only undergraduate students at that, our lab. And all of the experiments I'll be sharing have been done by undergraduates. Some of the cases they've been done by professors um, in some of the biological studies, but I'll, I'll point those out. So as an organic chemist, uh, the goals in my research group are to design new synthetic organic chemistry reactions that allow us to construct novelly, novel biologically active molecules. So organic chemistry is more than just memorizing reactions and torturing sophomore chemistry students. It's about creating molecules that have applications to medicine. Um, and so also with that in mind, we also like to implement the principles of green chemistry to create more sustainable reactions that are better for the environment. And then finally, we want to take these new molecules that we've made and collaborate with biologists. And in my case, I've collaborated with biologists at Benedictine University, and they will test, they've tested the anti-cancer and antibiotic activity. We're also interested in malaria, but we haven't yet got into that. And then finally, we like to take um, these projects that I've developed and then implement them as cures into undergraduate labs. So students, instead of synthesizing organic molecules in an organic lab that just go into the waste, they can create molecules that go on to contribute to science and um, be part of the research program. So there's three, three kind of projects I'll talk about. The first one will be synthesizing endoperoxide containing molecules with potential antimalarial and anti-cancer activity with reactive oxygen species that are generated. Then I will talk about the biological um, testing of these endoperoxides and the results from there. And then finally, I'll talk about a new project. We've been working with a microbiologist where we're synthesizing and studying the structure activity analysis of small molecules that modulate bacterial communication known as quorum sensing, so disrupting how bacteria talk to each other. So before I get into any of the results, I want to acknowledge the students that have worked on all this. Um, the endoperoxides that have anti-cancer activity, uh, there's a large group of students, Mahmoud, Harsh, Tyler, Rashad, Alyssa, Faith, um, and Mayeli have all worked on that. And then Dr. Sarathi and Dr. Poach did the biological testing, their research group, um, and their students are down here. And then in the last project, I worked with uh, microbiologist Dr. Perez Morales, and then um, one of my current students, Mayeli, did all of the synthesis in that project, which she did a lot of work. All right, so first we'll talk about malaria. So malaria is a life-threatening disease. It's called by, caused by parasites that are transmitted through infected mosquitoes. And the symptoms are high fever, chills, pain, diarrhea, and vomiting. And it can lead to death mostly through dehydration and in third world countries where there's not a lot of um, medical care. And in 2019, the World Health Organization reported 219 million cases and then almost a half million deaths. Now, that doesn't sound so bad compared to some of the devastating numbers we've heard with COVID, but this has been going on for a really long time. And the numbers have gone down a little bit, but they've kind of plateaued at about half a million people dying. And most of those people that are dying are in Africa, and um, a child in Africa dies every two minutes from malaria. So um, 
more than half of these deaths are children in Africa. And so, and the reason is because they don't have the availability of the healthcare that we have in the developing world. So there have been a number of drugs that were developed for malaria. The original drug was quinine. Um, in the 1600s, the conquistadors in Peru found that there was a tea from the bark of the chincona tree that could cure fevers, which was caused by malaria parasites. And it wasn't until um, the 1820s that they actually figured out that the molecule was known as quinine. Now, if you've ever heard of tonic water, which is here, it's kind of got a bitter taste. And the reason it has a bitter taste is because quinine is in there. And um, Great Britain was trying to prevent malaria in India and as it was conquesting around the world. And so they developed tonic water to, as a prophylactic to help prevent malaria. And they made it taste better by adding sugar and eventually gin, and that's where you get your gin and tonic. So now people choose to take a drink that was actually originally a medicine. Um, so then after that, the parasites began to develop resistance, meaning they developed ways to get around this drug and it was not killing the parasites. And so synthetic organic chemistry was starting to blossom in the 1930s and 40s. And in Germany, they developed this molecule called chloroquinine. And you may have heard of this, or hydroxychloroquinine, quinine being attempted to use for COVID, but its original use was to treat malaria. Now, it did work. Unfortunately, there were a lot of nasty side effects, which still are present. Um, and these, the parasites also developed um, resistance to this molecule. And in the 1970s, when the Vietnam War was going on, um, China focused their research efforts on developing and discovering molecules to treat malaria because the troops in Vietnam were succumbing to malaria from the mosquitoes. And so they scoured the literature from ancient recipes. And there was one scientist, Yu Yu Tu, she investigated over 2,000 different um, historical records of different teas to treat fevers, trying to find something to cure malaria. And eventually she was successful and she found that you could um, extract from the sweet wormwood tree a molecule called artemisinin. And originally they tried a hot extraction and it didn't work. And they actually found they had to do it cold and that's because this key part right here, this peroxide, this oxygen oxygen mon, is somewhat fragile, and so heating it up in a tea destroys it. So you have to do a cold extraction. So sometimes a cold tea is better than a hot tea. So that's kind of the development. And artemisinin and its analogs, so molecules that are similar to it, are the frontline treatment against um, malaria parasites, the main one known as Plasmodium falciparum. And so they isolate this molecule from the sweet wormwood tree, and they can do reactions to this molecule to modify it slightly to make it a little, little bit better. And Yu Yu Tu, who first discovered this in 1972, she was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2015 um, in physiology and medicine. So she was really a pioneer in, in medicinal chemistry and natural products. So taking molecules from nature and applying them to medicine to inspire. And then more recently, artemisinin has shown cytotoxicity towards cancer cell lines as well. And this is the area that we're really focusing on because in order to study malaria, you have to have human blood as the host and um, that's a little bit more difficult to study in our environment. So we're gonna study cancer cells. So how does artemisinin act as an anti-malarial and anti-cancer drug? So the key part of this molecule that makes it active is this endoperoxide. So a peroxide is an oxygen-oxygen single bond here, and an endoperoxide is in a ring, in this case kind of a bridging ring. And peroxides are oxidants, and they are very reactive, and they can form radicals in the presence of iron and undergo Fenton reactions, and it forms reactive oxygen species, and these then go to destroy or damage proteins in the cell, and then the cell will die and that happens in both malaria parasites as well as cancer cells. And so these reactive oxygen species are the key. And so the key part of this drug that makes it work is the peroxide, and that's called a pharmacophore. A pharmacophore is the essential part of a drug that if you took it away, it wouldn't work. So they were able to synthesize a molecule like this that looks just like artemisinin, but now it only has one oxygen there. That has absolute no activity and so it doesn't work at all. And so that shows that this endoperoxide is the part that you need. 
And so cancer cells also succumb to um, the, the reactive oxygen species. Now, the reason that cancer cells are more susceptible than um, normal cells is that cancer cells have a higher expression of transferrin receptors, which allow iron to be imported into the cell. And so that it leads to a higher concentration of iron inside of the cell versus normal cells. And so then the iron reacts with artemisinin, you get reactive oxygen species, then the cell says we need to die, kill ourselves, and that is apoptosis. And so it leads to the cell death. And so what we're hoping to do is to design molecules that are similar to artemisinin, but can be made on um, a larger scale in a simple fashion and have similar activity and kind of study the activity of those molecules. And so artemisinin does have some limitations. There's high production costs, which chemists are working on developing ways to make it more efficiently and semi-synthetically. Um, it has limited availability in these underdeveloped countries. And this is, you can see on this map, this is where the incidence of malaria are. Most of them are in Africa and South America and Southeast Asia and a lot of developing countries where they don't have as much access to healthcare. And so ideally we want to make a drug that could be synthesized in those countries on a scale that would be, you know, enough to, to support them. So another problem with artemisinin is it's poor bioavailability. Bioavailability is when you take a drug, not 100% of the drug goes to where it's supposed to and is active. You know, if you take a painkiller, it doesn't all go into, you know, curing your pain. Some of it gets excreted, some doesn't get absorbed. And so the bioavailability of artemisinin is pretty low. And so we're hoping to design molecules that might, you know, improve that. And then malaria parasites can also develop resistance to drugs, and so developing new ones is always important. So our, co our goal of this project is to take artemisinin and figure out a way to synthesize simple trioxane analogs. So a trioxane, tri meaning three, and oxane for oxygen, you've got this six atom ring with two oxygens here in this peroxide, a carbon here, and then another oxygen. And this is kind of like an acetal here, where you have an oxygen, carbon, oxygen bond there. And so the initial idea to create this molecule was to start with a symmetrical peroxide, this peroxyquinone, and react it with an aldehyde or ketone in the presence of an acid catalyst, and it will undergo a cascade reaction. A cascade reaction is a reaction in which you have more than one step happening, two different reactions to get to the final product there. Now you can kind of see that the blue aldehyde is mapped right onto here. And then we'll test these um, analogs for their activity. So in organic synthesis, just a little over overview if you haven't taken organic chemistry before, or it's been a while. So you're gonna take simple building blocks that you can purchase. Then we have to optimize new reaction conditions. So to get the optimal reaction, then we need to purify our product and then confirm the identity and purity of it, mainly using NMR spectroscopy and mass spectrometry. And then once we have our pure molecule and we can confirm, yes, we have this molecule, it's very pure, then we can give it to the biologist and then they can test the activity. You want to make sure your molecule is pure because even a slight impurity can skew your biological results. So to start our synthesis, we need our peroxyquinone here, and this can be synthesized from paracresol, which can be purchased from, um, on, from $30 a kilogram. You can even get it a lot cheaper than that in bulk. And then oxone is the oxidant, which is $20 a kilogram, pretty inexpensive. So this is something that can be done on a fairly large scale in water, acetonitrile, and baking soda. And it goes through this intermediate here, which breaks apart with water, and you get to your peroxyquinone. Now, a lot of times people hear about peroxides and they think something that's really unstable. Um, hydrogen peroxide is stored in a brown bottle for a reason because the light can cause those peroxide, the peroxide bond to break. Also, some people even store it in the refrigerator because heat can cause it to break as well. So our peroxides are fairly stable. They're nice crystalline solids and they're stable at room temperature for a long time, but we generally store them in a fridge or a freezer um, to help them last longer. And um, keeping peroxides cold generally is safer, even if we think that they're safe. Not everyone believes us. So our initial results from this were that we could take a peroxyquinone, react it with an aldehyde, and then we were able to use a chiral phosphoric acid 
and get our product in high yield and excellent enantioselectivity, meaning we're only making one of the possible stereoisomers. There's eight different stereoisomers that you could make for this. There's three chiral centers, and if you remember two to the n number of chiral centers, you can get eight possible stereoisomers, and we only make one of them. And we use this chiral acid here to control that reaction. And you can see that our peroxide here kind of mimics the one that's in artemisinin. And the mechanism for this reaction, if you've taken organic chemistry, this is something that you should be able to, to go along with. And at the end of Orgo 2, definitely, this could be a good exam question. So here we've got our peroxide adding to an aldehyde that's been activated by um, our phosphoric acid. This is similar to acetal chemistry. We get to a hemiacetal here. There's a proton transfer that's removed. And now we get to this intermediate. Now we can look at this. The next thing that needs to happen is we need to close the ring. Now generally when nucleophiles add, they add to the carbonyl carbon. But there's a reaction called a Michael reaction in which your nucleophile adds to an adjacent alkene and the electrons can flow all the way up to the oxygen. So now we're using an acid to activate our ketone here and we close the ring through a 1,4 or Michael reaction. This undergoes a proton transfer and then the enol to tomorizes to the more stable keto form and that gets to the product. So that's kind of the proposed product or proposed reaction mechanism there. So how we kind of developed this reaction through optimization once we had it was we screened a number of different chiral phosphoric acid catalysts. So these are phosphoric acids that have a chiral scaffold or backbone. In order to control a reaction, you need to use a chiral molecule similar to an enzyme to kind of control this reaction. And we found that this um, strip or spirobisendane backbone catalyst gave us the highest enantioselectivity, meaning it's choosing the enantiomer um, and we're getting almost exclusively one of them. However, the yield was only 35%. In order to optimize that, we first screened a lot of different solvents and we found that dichloroethane slightly improved it up to 40%. This is all at room temperature with 10% catalyst loading. We then increased the temperature and found that at 50 degrees Celsius, we could improve the yield all the way up to 88% while still maintaining our enantial selectivity. A lot of times when you heat up a reaction, the selectivity will also go down. In this case, it's maintained, which is excellent. Then 10% catalyst loading is not very good for this in terms of the cost because this catalyst is expensive, or if you want to synthesize it, it's 13 reactions to make it. So um, when I did make it, it was you know, very precious to have that. So we wanted to decrease the loading. However, we found that once we dropped from 10 mole percent down to five, the yield got chopped off a lot. So unfortunately, that wasn't working. What we turned to was to try other additives that are achiral, um, meaning that these don't have any chiral centers, and these are things that you can buy. And we found that if we had 5% of a co-catalyst, this thiourea, that we could get similar yields to using 10 mole percent of the really expensive um, chiral acid catalyst. And so that was really good because now we only have to use half of our very expensive catalyst. So once we got our reaction optimized, we then screen the scope. So organic chemists, once they figure out a reaction works, they find everything on the shelf that they have, and then they see which things work and which things don't. And in general, the reactions work well with a variety of aldehydes. So our aldehyde here is in blue. So we can swap out this blue group, and we can have hydrogen, isopropyl, cyclohexyl, a number of different groups on there. We also have aromatic groups at the bottom here, but the yields are a little bit lower. Then we can also substitute the groups on the peroxyquinone, the green groups. And changing those, you can get a variety of different things. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, changing the structure of a molecule can change its biological activity or its bioavailability, its solubility, its physical properties. And so being able to make a variety of molecules will allow us to create a library of molecules to test to see which one's the best and understand um, what makes the molecules work better. So the mechanism for this reaction is kind of cool, at least in my opinion. So the first step of this reaction, when we take our peroxyquinol and make this intermediate, the hemiacetal, it actually makes a racemic mixture. It makes both enantiomers. You can see this is dashed and that's wedged. So it makes a 50-50 mixture. In organic chemistry, when you're learning organic chemistry reactions, 
you learn that all the reactions make racemic mixtures unless there's some chiral catalyst controlling. You always get racemic mixtures. Everything's racemic when there's a chiral center. Well, the same thing is true here, even with our chiral acid catalyst. We use our special super expensive chiral acid catalyst and we get a racemic mixture. However, now when this reacts with the chiral acid, only one of these reacts. And you can notice that this arrow here is an equilibrium arrow, meaning it can go back and forth. So this is what's called a dynamic kinetic resolution, where the first step makes a racemic mixture, but only one of these two enantiomers goes onto the product, and this re-equilibrates to a 50-50 mixture. So eventually, 100% of your product can siphon over to one of the stereoisomers. So there's eight possible stereoisomers you can make, but it only makes one of them, and it goes through this. Um, and the reason is that the chiral catalyst um, fits best with, with this, and it goes through a matched interaction where it's lined up. And this one is slow and it's mismatched. And here we have kind of like a transition state that we're proposing. It is a 13-membered ring here, which is a little bit of a stretch. But um, there have been some other groups that have done some calculations in similar systems that show that there is some evidence for this, where we're having phosphoric acid activation of our uh, ketone here, and then there's some directed of the oxygen adding here. Now, in terms of the diastereoselectivity, because you can form a number of different diastereomers, this is the preferred chair conformation. So chair conformers have different um, stabilities, and this chair conformer, um, there it's minimizing A13 diaxial interactions, where here the ring is on the top, and you have this bumping into that. And so this is disfavored. And so this explains the diastereoselectivity, and then the chiral catalyst here controls the enantioselectivity, making one enantiomer. So it's pretty cool that that catalyst can control, so you only make one of those. We were able to study this by um, chiral HPLC, so high performance liquid chromatography, which is um, a system that separates molecules through chromatography, and you can separate enantiomers. And what we found is that we could monitor the reaction over time. And at five minutes, the enantioselectivity of this is zero, meaning that there's 50% of each of these enantiomers. So we can see that by HPLC, that this intermediate is a mixture of two enantiomers. However, after an hour, we still have some A, and it's still 0% enantiomeric excess, meaning it's a 50-50 mixture of both. However, our product is 96% um, enantiomeric excess, meaning there's an excess of this enantiomer, um, 96%. And so that shows us that we have evidence that we can see this is racemic and that the product that we're making is nearly a single enantiomer. So it's kind of cool that we can visualize that. So after we were able to develop this with an aldehyde and ketone, the next thing we had was an idea to take an imine and react that in the same system to create a molecule here with a nitrogen in it known as a dioxazinine. So it's the same molecule, these two oxygens here, this peroxide, but instead of an oxygen, we have a nitrogen. Now, why would we want to do that? Well, actually, in the literature, there, no one's ever reported a six-membered ring with two oxygens, then a carbon and a nitrogen. This dioxazinine hadn't even been reported, and so we're like, that's pretty cool. We can make this using our new reaction that we've developed. Also, the nitrogen here might, may offer better bioavailability, um, and um, so we thought we could get better activity as well. So we thought this would be pretty easy. We just swap out aldehyde for imine. Imines are very similar to aldehydes in that we have this um, double bond to a heteroatom. And we can synthesize these by taking aldehydes and then an amine um, with magnesium sulfate, and it will um, lose water, and then we create an imine. This is one of the prettier imines that we made with anthracene. It's this bright yellow, cool color. Um, so we made most of these imines. And then we screened these with a number of different acid catalysts, and our imines didn't work. No, nothing, 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 nothing. Nothing's working. The aldehydes worked great. And eventually we found an imine with a benzene ring and then a methyl group of the nitrogen gave us a pretty low yield. We were able to like observe just a little bit of it. And we were really confused. And so we screened a whole bunch of different acids and base catalysts. This is just some of the ones they screened. And they still didn't get any product. They got a lot of decomposition or starting materials recovered and nothing was happening. So at one point I just told the students, Go to the lab, 
just mix the imine and the peroxide together and see if it's decomposing or what's happening. And so they did that, and they came back a day later to see if it decomposed, and they ended up getting 88% yield of the product, which <laughs> that's when your control reaction actually produces your product is really confusing but exciting. So they got the product, and it was a single diastereomer. Now, there's no catalyst here, so we're, not, we're making a racemic mixture, so we're not controlling it. But we don't have to use the chiral catalyst to get there. And it gets the same single diastereomer through a similar transition state that we looked at before. And the mechanism we propose is very similar, where our oxygen adds to our imine, just like it added to the aldehyde. But instead of being activated by an acid, it's not activated at all. It may even be activated um, by the imine acting as a base on the peroxide. And it adds, it undergoes a proton transfer. And then here, the nitrogen connects and forms our ring. And then we undergo proton transfer into tautomerization, and we get to our product through the same mechanism. So the only difference between this and the aldehyde is that we have a nitrogen here. And with the aldehyde, we needed the acid catalyst. Without the acid catalyst, nothing happened. And so one thing we were wondering is, is this reaction reversible? So in the last reaction, the first step was reversible. Maybe in this reaction, all the steps are reversible. So what we did was what we call a crossover experiment. So we took our product, and then we reacted it with a different imine here, this toluene um, imine. And if it's reversible, we should see a mixture of products here where the red molecule gets incorporated into here. But we don't see that. So that tells us that this last step, the azomichal reaction, is not reversible. So you can't go backwards under the reaction conditions because if you add a different imine in here that's very similar, you don't observe that product. So after we got this reaction to work, we screened it with everything that we had, and we found that a number of different molecules were tolerated. So here we're changing the red group on the imine. You can see that a number of different aromatic groups work. Um, anything that's non-aromatic does not work, especially if it has um, alpha hydrogens there, because then it can do other types of reactions. So we need to have an aromatic ring here or something that doesn't have alpha hydrogens next door to it. So most of these work in pretty good yield. We can also replace the blue group on the nitrogen. We found that methyl works, ethyl groups, we can even put a hydrogen on here, which is kind of impressive, because then you can replace that later. This one is really cool that we have this cyclic imine. However, if you notice, these are pretty good yields. But once you get to propyl, three carbons here, the yield drops off significantly. And if you do a butyl group, it doesn't work at all. So once this is um, larger, it cannot undergo the cyclization or closing the ring. So too big, it doesn't work. So there are constraints to this reaction. And then we also change the green groups on the peroxyquinone. We could have ethyl groups over here. We could have more substitution. We could also form this cool kind of tricyclic product there. So after we developed the reaction and found the scope, we were also looking at the same time to make the reaction more environmentally friendly. The current reaction as it is takes an imine with an aldehyde, or an amine with an aldehyde and magnesium sulfate, and that makes our imine. We use two equivalents of this. So there's an extra imine that's lost as waste. Then we react it with our peroxide, and we use toluene as a solvent. However, in order to optimize this, we want to maybe reduce the solvent and turn this into a one-pot reaction. So after a number of different iterations, we found that we could take our amine and our aldehyde and pre-mix these and then add our peroxide in one pot with magnesium sulfate. So you generate your imine in situ, and then it happens all at once. So you're doing three reactions at once. You're forming your imine, this is the peroxide's adding to it, and then it's cyclizing to form the ring. So you're doing everything all at once. And the solvent, our amine here, is in ethanol, and so it's pretty cool that we can do that. So overall, we kind of like, we have no catalyst, which means we can't control the reaction and make one an antimer. But it does mean that there's no waste from the catalyst. Ethanol is our solvent here, so it's renewable. And then we, we have atom economy, because the only byproduct of our reaction is water. And then we're doing one reaction instead of multiple steps, so there's reduced purification. So you don't have to do as much col column chromatography. 
And so then once we've developed this, we then took this and applied it to a cure. So organic chemistry students often do synthesis projects where they're synthesizing molecules that you know, millions of people have made before, they make it, and then they put it into a waste container. And we thought, why not take the reaction that we just developed that's pretty modular, where you can have these different um, components and have students propose new molecules that no one's ever made before and try them out. And so we've had people do this and they participate in genuine research and it's an interdisciplinary scientific collaboration because we're then giving these molecules to biology students who are testing them. And so there's an advanced biology course where they can actually, they grow the cancer cells and then they test the activity. And so these are some of the molecules from a recent group that did that and some of them got pretty creative. You can see that they are making molecules with these cool kind of bicyclic structures and extra groups on there. And um, we're, we're going to test those molecules and see, see if they work just as well as the other ones. So, and we're hoping to do this more in the, this is in the honors organic chemistry lab. We're hoping to apply this even to the non-honors lab that all the students can participate in this um, here. All right, so the next part of the talk, I'm going to be talking about um, how the testing of these endoperoxides to see their biological activity. So the way that they work, uh, they do this, is they grow cancer cells to confluency, and then they treat them with our drugs, or DMSO as a control, and then they incubate them um, with dyes, and then they do fluorescence to measure them, and they use flow cytometry to see if the cells um, are dying through apoptosis or necrosis, and you can monitor that. Basically, the cells are glowing in different colors. So here, a lot of research went into these slides, but I've kind of summarized them here. But um, we've got DMR and HSM. Um, so the DMR is the peroxide in the trioxane, and HSM has the nitrogen here. So this is in breast cancer cells. So this is the control with DMSO. So DMR1 um, causes almost 50% apoptosis, or programmed cell death, of the cancer cells. So this is pretty cool that with no drug, we've got very little apoptosis, but with our drug um, at 10 micromolar, we're getting, um, that's the 10, 10 micromolar, we're getting 50% cell death. And HSM2, we're only getting 20%, so it's not quite as good. So there's a difference. The trioxane here is better than the dioxazinine. And then we took the same drugs and we treated them with normal breast cancer cells. And you can see the control here compared to our two drugs is very similar. So healthy cells are not being killed at a higher rate with our drugs. Whereas in the cancer cells, the DMR is causing cell death more. So that's really cool that we have selectivity because in normal chemotherapeutics, you have cancer cells are growing faster and they'll uptake more of a drug, but there's also um, negative side effects for other parts of the body that are growing quickly, such as your hair and your immune system that are impacted by chemotherapeutics. And so we believe that this is um, selective because cancers have a higher concentration of iron in them and a greater expression of these transferrin receptors. And so I showed this before where the iron goes into the cancer cells and there's a higher concentration of it. It reacts with the artemisinin and you get more reactive oxygen species leading to the cell death. So more iron can react with artemisinin, undergo fenton chemistry and create reactive oxygen species. Those oxygen radicals destroy the proteins or damage them and then the cells decide that they're not gonna live and they kill themselves. So we also looked at lung cancer. And so healthy lung cells, um, when they're treated with our drug, oh, so this is looking at the, the cellular iron content. So if you look at healthy lung cells, the amount of iron in them is much less than in cancerous lung and colon cells. So you can see the iron content here is a lot higher. So looking at that iron content through a colorimetric assay, we can see that the cancer cells do have more iron in them. We then also tested it with a reactive oxygen species sca scavenger. So N-acetyl um, serine is an antioxidant here that can scavenge reactive, reactive oxygen species. So if we do our control or if we just have our reactive oxygen species um, scavenger, we don't get much apoptosis. Once we add our drug, 
the cells die. But if we mix our drug with the antioxidant, now our drug doesn't work anymore. So that's showing us that the drug is working likely through reactive oxygen species because once we eliminate those, it can't kill the cells. And then if we look at lung cancer cells, DMR, the trioxane, um, isn't quite as good as the molecule with the nitrogen. So HSM has the nitrogen in the ring, and this is more selective for lung cancer cells. So the trioxane works better on breast cancer, and HSM works better on lung cancer. We don't quite have a clear picture on why yet, the nitrogen versus the oxygen, but we are looking into that. And what we're looking at here is here we have defroximine, which is an iron chelator. And so if we chelate the iron inside of the cells, the cytotoxicity or inducing apoptosis goes all the way down to near zero. So if you chelate the iron inside the cell, they, they can't kill it anymore because they can't generate the reactive oxygen species. So if you eliminate reactive oxygen species or if you chelate iron so it can't do the Fenton chemistry, the cells don't die. So this leads evidence that it's going through an ROS pathway. So overall, we created um, synthetic endoperoxides, and we found that they induce apoptosis, or cell death, in cancer cells, but not in normal cells, at least in lung cancer and breast cancer. We found that the trioxanes with the oxygen have better activity in the breast cancer cell lines, and the dioxazinanes, the one with the nitrogen, are better against lung cancer. So you can get selectivity, different drugs are better for different cancer cells. And then we found that endoperoxides generate ROS that lead to apoptosis, and that ROS scavengers inhibit our drug's activity. And then finally, the cancer cells were found to have a higher concentration of iron and more transferrin receptors. Another thing that I didn't show was that if you do a knockout of the transferrin receptors, in the cancer cells, then the drugs don't work anymore because they don't have the transferrin receptors. And you can use CRISPR, the gene editing, they, that's what they use to knock out that receptor. And then once they knock out that receptor, the iron's not going into the cell and our drugs don't work anymore as well. Um, but also we can do chelation of the iron and that inhibits the activity. So overall, we believe that our molecules are creating reactive oxygen species that are leading to selective um, apoptosis in cancer cells. All right, so the last part of my talk is going to be on bacterial quorum sensing. So bacterial quorum sensing is on how bacteria communicate with each other. So we communicate with words, but bacteria don't have vocal cords. So the way that they communicate is through pheromones or molecules. Most of these molecules are small peptides. And so bacteria can um, export peptides that then can be imported by another bacterium to sense if there's more of them around. Now, the goal of bacteria is to survive, just like all species. And the way they survive is by working together. And sometimes bacteria can do things like create biofilms or create virulence factors, like toxins, to, to you know, kill a host. Or they can even become bioluminescent. There's a type of jellyfish that has a bacteria in it that glows at night and it mimics the starlight and so the jellyfish um, looks like the stars and so predators don't eat it and the bacteria that are inside of it cause that bioluminescence only because there's enough of them and if there's not enough bacteria in that jellyfish it won't glow and so the bacteria can talk to each other and say hey if we work together and glow we can live longer because now the jellyfish that we're in doesn't get eaten and so you know, they're not actually thinking like that, but that's how they're working through this quorum sensing. And so when bacteria notice that there's enough of them around, they say, hey, let's do something that costs a lot of energy. It might be risky, but the reward will be, you know, living longer. And so they export these signals. They sense that there's more of them around. And then there's genes that are regulated by these signals. And then there's transcriptin factors that will cause different things to occur. Either a toxin's released, or they form a biofilm, or um, they glow. And so one of the bacteria that we're studying was Lactobacillus acidophilus, which is a bacteria that's in your gut. You may have heard of this, yogurt. Um, and biofilms in your gut are really important for your microbiome and your gut health. And so having them form these biofilms is really important. And so what we wanted to study is how does this 
system work? The peptide that causes this regulation here is not known. Also, the protein that the peptide targets is not known as well. And so there's not a good way to study it yet. So what our hope was is to find a molecule that can modulate this so that we can better understand how it's regulated and eventually get to a peptide that's controlling this. And then if you want to design a drug that will you know, turn on biofilm formation or turn it off, um, there are a lot of biofilms and medical devices that need to be eliminated, and so if you can prevent biofilm formation in medical devices, um, that will be good. So some places medical devices, or some places biofilm is good, other places it could be bad. So in biofilm formation, you have single bacterium here, and they start to kind of build up like this. And the biofilm will look like this, and it creates a structure that allows the bacteria to have a support system and allows it to survive. And the way it's visualized, here we have no biofilm. And in the lab, we can stain the bacterium with a dye, and you can see a biofilm develop and, and visualize it. And so this is how we measure the activity. Um, so we have compounds that we treat the bacteria with, and then we stain them, and then we can see if they are developing biofilms. We are also able to put um, um, fluorescence into the bacterium and so that if the biofilm formation is turned on the bacteria also glow and so you can do fluorescence imaging to see if the gene is being um, turned on by the the molecule so the first thing we need to do is to discover a lead compound so how are drugs developed well sometimes computers are used to design a molecule that is going to fit into a particular target. But in our case, we don't know what the target is, and we don't really know what the molecule is. So one of the basic ways to discover a drug is brute force. And so that's generally through high throughput screening, screening tens or hundreds of thousands of molecules and seeing which ones work, and then learning from those. And so what we want to do is find an artificial promoter, a, a, a molecule, um, a small molecule that can regulate this bacterial communication. And if it promotes it, it could be a probiotic. And if it inhibits it, it could be used as an antibiotic. So there's a lot of cool potential for this. So we worked with the University of Illinois Chicago. They have a, um, a compound library, and we screened 10,000 of their compounds through high throughput screening. And through this process, three out of 10,000 um, were hits. They worked. They, they generated biofilms. And uh, we found that. So better than zero. Um, so that's where we started. And the best one was this compound called M0446. Now, one thing is that these compounds sometimes are proprietary, and the molecules aren't actually in the literature. And no one's ever reported them. So you may get a hit from a molecule, but no one's ever made it before, and you can't really buy it. So what we had to do then is to figure out a way to synthesize this. So those of you that are in um, the synthesis course, doing retrosynthesis, maybe you can look at this and see how you would break this apart. Well, one thing you might see is there's an amide here. Anyone know how to make amides? A carboxylic acid and amine, or even better, maybe an acid chloride. So yeah, great. So you can couple that on there. That's going to break that. Now the other part here, making this heterocyclic ring structure is a little bit more advanced, but it's going to use reactions that are condensation reactions. So we had to develop a synthesis. So the way that we broke this apart was into the blue part here. You can see this green part and then the red part here on the top. So three different pieces. And when we break it apart into three pieces like that, into that modularity, it's really good because if you want to change the structure, you can easily swap out a blue piece, maybe a green piece or a red piece in your synthesis so that you can change the structure easily. If you're doing it in a linear fashion where it's difficult to change out those pieces, then it's going to be more time intensive. So the first step in the synthesis was taking this um, Bach-protected piperidinone, so this green ring here, and then we react it with DMF-DMA. Now this reaction undergoes something similar to an aldol. So an aldol reaction, you have um, a ketone or an aldehyde with acidic alpha hydrogens here. And this can add into the DMF-DMA. And then eventually it's going to 
add into it, and then you'll get this enamine intermediate here. So the product of this step was only 30% yield, and we couldn't really get it any higher. But in medicinal chemistry at this stage, we're not really interested in making excellent yields. We just want to make the molecule. It doesn't matter how you get there, just make it. Low yields, whatever. So we made that first step here, and now we have the green piece. So now what we're going to do is add the red piece on here. So we add this fluorobenzamidine, and what's going to happen is the amine is going to condense onto our ketone here to form the imine, and then the other nitrogen will add into this carbon through a Michael reaction, and it'll add in, and then we'll eliminate dimethylamine, and that forms this cyclic heterocycle here. And we get a little bit better yield, 47% here. And so that's the second step. Now the last two steps, we need to add on the blue piece. Now we're going to remove this bot group, which is called a protecting group. The reason we have that protecting group there is because if this nitrogen was around for the first two steps, it would allow other reactions to happen. And so you can't have that nitrogen just be an NH. So we deprotect it using trifluoroacetic acid. And that takes off the Bach protecting group. And now we have a nitrogen with a free hydrogen here. And then we can do the last step that you guys figured out. And we're going to take an acid chloride, pair it up with our amine, and now we make our amide. And so in 7.5% over, overall, overall yield, in four steps, we get to this molecule. So it takes you four reactions to make one molecule. Now, if we want to test a whole bunch of different molecules, you know, let's say we want to do 15 molecules, that's a lot of different reactions. So Mayeli was able to do a lot of work. She synthesized a lot of molecules and did a lot of column chromatography purifying these. So once we made this molecule, we tested it, and it indeed induced biofilm formation. And we're like, great, now we have a, a, a molecule that can help us probe quorum sensing. We know how to turn it on. We can use this molecule, and we can turn it on. Now we want to know, what about this molecule can we change to study what causes its biological activity, or what's important? If you remember in the artemisinin molecules, what was the key pharmacophore? What part of the drug that killed the cancer cells was really important? The peroxide. So you needed that oxygen-oxygen bond. So what we want to do is figure out what's the pharmacophore here. Now this isn't generate reactive oxygens, generating reactive oxygen species. This is likely binding to a protein. So it's kind of like fitting into a protein and turning on that gene. So we want to test, is this fluorine important? Is this ring important? Maybe the sulfur or the chlorine? We're pretty sure that this ring system is important, and it's going to be difficult to change this. So we could change that, but we didn't get to that yet. So to create a number of different analogs, the first step's exactly the same. But then here we can swap out the red with different functional groups here. And then we can use different acid chlorides to add on there. And so through this synthesis, we can make a library of analogs. And so she was able to do that to make um, this is 10 of the 15 molecules that she synthesized, where she swapped out X for either fluorine or hydrogen, and then the amides had a number of different ring systems on here. So when you have bacteria and you don't put any drug in there, they create biofilms. Bacteria create biofilms naturally because they're releasing natural peptide molecules and they make biofilms. So what we're looking at is a molecule that promotes it. So when we're studying the biofilm formation, we add our molecule to it, and it induces biofilm formation faster than the normal rate. And so it's helping turn on that biofilm formation gene, and it's going faster. So we found that the molecule worked just like the one we found from the 10,000 compound library. And if we swap the fluorine out for hydrogen, it's still active. So that tells us. Having a fluorine here isn't really important. What we did next is we swapped out the chlorine on our thiophene. This ring right here is called a thiophene with a hydrogen. And we found that that turned off biofilm formation. It grew the biofilm just as fast as it normally would. Not any faster, not any slower. And we tried these with both fluorine and hydrogen. If we take our thiophene with the chlorine and convert it to a benzene ring, that also does not induce the biofilm formation faster. So having a benzene ring there doesn't make it any faster. So that tells us 
having the chlorine is really important and that this sulfur might also be really important. When you have a molecule that's binding to a protein, generally you're binding to either hydrophobic pockets or you're doing hydrogen bonding. And this sulfur here can act as a hydrogen bond acceptor where the hydrogen can bond to that. So it might be binding to amino acid in the protein through hydrogen bond accepting. And this might be binding through van der Waals interactions in a hydrophobic pocket. If we take our ring here and we flip it to the different isomers, so here the carbonyl is connected right next to the sulfur. If we put the sulfur on the other side, this also does not induce biofilm formation. Um, we also have the hydrogen there, but in order to make this one with the chlorine, uh, we would have had to do another four steps to make that, so we didn't do that reaction. However, interestingly, if we add a methylene group, a CH2 group in here, extending the thiophene ring out a little bit, it now turns it on. And so it's kind of making it extend a little bit further. And if you think about a drug binding to a pocket, it's got a shape to it. And so the chlorine is fitting in there. And if we add this group in here, it can extend further, maybe where this chlorine is fitting in, and it's still turning it on. So we don't know what protein it's binding to yet. That's the next step that we're going to investigate. But we're kind of getting an idea of what shape we're going to be fitting into. And then eventually, once we get uh, the protein structure, we can do maybe docking studies to figure out how our drugs are binding. Then, interesting here, if we remove the chlorine but add another ring here in this thioindole here, this is also active. So it's showing that probably some van der Waals interactions going off on this side are really important in the, in the binding. So all of these studies were done with um, Lactobacillus acidophilus, which is the bacterium you got. Another bacteria that we studied that had similar activity was, um, and overall we found the fluorine was not important. You need the chlorine or some other ring here or hydrophobic group extending, and the sulfur is also needed. So we also looked at Streptococcus py pyogenes, and um, our Molecule from the screening was active, and we got similar results. All the other results were very similar. However, this was really cool. If we take the molecule that was active in the um, lactobacillus and we use this, it's actually an antagonist. If we put this molecule in, it turns off biofilm formation completely. So normally, the bacteria release peptide. It causes biofilm formation. If you add this drug, it makes it go faster, turns it on. However, in this strain of bacteria, using this molecule, it acts as what's called an antagonist, meaning it's binding to that protein, but it's turning it off, and the natural molecule can't come in and turn it on. And so a little bit of medicinal chemistry here. So an agonist versus an antagonist. So an agonist binds to a receptor, and in this case, the receptor is inside of the cell, not on the outside and you get full activation. There's usually natural messengers that are binding, giving you some activation, but the agonist turns it on. And so that would be this molecule. This is turning it on. However, this antagonist binds with a different kind of induced fit, and it binds in such a way that the natural molecule can't come in and bind anymore, and it doesn't turn it on. Now what we're doing is competition studies with the natural peptide, and if we swamp it with natural peptide, if this is binding um, reversibly, we should be able to push it out and get the biofilm formation to occur. However, if this is binding irreversibly somehow, which is unlikely, but there's possibilities that it could be adding to the ring here, then it would bind, and adding more of that peptide won't even turn it back on. So that's what we're looking at now. So overall, what we have here is our signal is binding to our regulator here and causing biofilm formation. And we discovered molecules that can either activate or even inhibit the RGG protein that's regulating that gene transcription. And so I'm really excited about figuring out which molecules can either inhibit or promote that biofilm formation because then you could lead to creating an antibiotic to turn off biofilm formation or um, a drug that can promote biofilm formation for better gut health. And this is kind of a summary of in lactobacillus what was important, and then in the streptococcus, the one that was the agonist and the antagonist. 
So that is it. And again, I want to thank all of the students that made this work possible. They worked really hard synthesizing lots of molecules, doing lots of column chromatography and NMR spectroscopy to determine the structure of these molecules. And Dr. Sarathi and Dr. Perez's research groups for doing all the biological testing. I'd like to thank you all for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah. Uh, you said if, uh, if the iron is chelated, mm -hmm. it won't be absorbed by the cancer cell. Is that what you're saying? No. It, the, the iron inside, it chelates the iron inside of the cell. And so then the cell, the, when the peroxide is inside of the cell, it can't react with it. So the chelator kind of um, makes it so that the iron can't do the Fenton chemistry. If the iron is already chelated, will it be absorbed as quickly as, you know, just ionic iron? Mm, prob probably, probably not. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. If you mind if I go back to that 13-member transition. Yeah. yeah. I just have a curiosity question. Yeah. yeah. So, if you, when you look at that, there, I'll get it. Yeah. I guess it's just, you know, there's small things about the vegetables. All right, so, if you look at where that, that uh, kind of six-member chair confirmation. Right here? Yeah. 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 And, and you're showing some intermolecular hydrogen bonding there, right? Yep. yep. Is it possible that that oxygen connected to the hydrogen has an n pi interaction there, and that's why it's stabilizing it? So it's not like a legit, then you end up with somewhat of a pseudo six member or seven member chair confirmation. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that would be possible. So if you're forming the pseudo bond there with that n pi. Yeah, no, no, yeah. Linearized at that point. Right? Exactly. exactly. So, so my question is, is that oxygen in that peroxy type compound there potentially n pi interacting there and giving it stability right to hold it in place? Yeah, yeah. so you might have some stability pseudo bonding there between that interaction and that would allow it. Yeah, I think that's probably likely. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Um, so we did do some of that. We can get down to one micromolar and it's still pretty good, which in terms of cancer drugs, one micromolar is not like spectacular. But if you have um, selectivity and it's one micromolar, then and it's not toxic because artemisinin analogs can be given at pretty high doses, then there's some degrees. One thing I didn't report is that at one micromolar, it's pretty reasonable. At 20, we saw a dip in our concentration curve. And then once we go back up to 50, it's back up again. And we repeated it like three or four times and we still saw that. So we're still looking into that. So that's kind of why I didn't report the dose on there yet, but yeah. Uh, another question I have is what's your uh, plans are um, possibly, we'll look at, at maybe mouse models, um, but haven't found any collaborators for that yet. But that would be the next step. Those are very expensive, though, so have to get funding. Any student questions? So um, we were doing absorptions. So it's stained with a dye, and then it's um, measuring the absorption of that. So. Um, all right. Well, if we don't have any other questions, let's thank Dr. Rubish again.